Yes, uh, so we haven't heard about this yet, so I want to now switch to, to VOAs. Actually, the main point with the screenings, of course, uh, but I would like to introduce, of course, a little bit of stuff. So, um, and I thought, like, usually usually you would sort of get rid of the conformal field theory part in one slide, um, and, I, and I decided at the beginning I want to a little bit try to motivate deeper, as I would do in a talk, what conformal field theory actually is. So maybe for uh, several people in the audience that's uh, boring and they can correct me if I say something wrong, but maybe for the other ones it's helpful to do it a little bit more uh, more thorough. Um, yes. So and I'll have to click again. Yes. So uh, this was my mistake. <laughs> I did some. I changed something like that. Yes. So for me, in a nutshell, um, I think the easiest thing to say is, in some sense, a conformal field theory is an axiomatization of a set of correlation functions where there's a conformal symmetry. So you have to imagine sort of a bunch of functions that depend on several variables, maybe in R and N or a, or, or C or whatever, and it's a, it's a bunch of functions that are very compatible with each other and, and somehow that's extremely restri restri restricted. Uh, so, and that's I think the, the, the one sentence you can put in a nutshell. And then what we have heard a couple of times, there is a chiral parts, so you can somehow split it up in a conformal, in a uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic parts, and that's something that uh, is another interesting thing, but we don't do this. Um, and then these have a certain associated representation theory, which we now study, and uh, in particular, it's a modular tensor category in good cases, and and sort of all the all the categorical structure. I will explain this more, but all the categorical structure that you get, you somehow get from from the analysis involved. So, for example, um, holomorphic now does not mean holomorphic in C, but it has singularity in zero, and it can be a multi-valued function. And if you start to analytically continue once around the singularity, then you get the braiding of the category. And for example, if you take a a basis of solutions which are like expanded around one singularity, so there is a certain preferred basis. If you re-expand it around the other singularity, that has to do with associativity. So somehow the analytical functions involved. So so you really have to imagine the spaces of functions, and that's actually what I what I want to put also as the second bullet because because we talk a lot about TFTs, and I myself talked a lot about TFTs without really knowing what it is, and. Uh, I think so in my uh, understanding. So these spaces that we associate in the TFT, these vector spaces that we associate to a to a manifold sigma, for example, are in actually spaces of these correlation functions, right? So so they're in spaces of functions. They're not just abstract vector spaces. And and you can write down the functions uh, basis in there, and, and you see how if you re-expand them and if you break them and so on, what happens. Um, and these these maps that M for a manifold, maybe you can imagine the time development or something. Um, and the important thing is that these these Correlation functions transform, of course, physically they have to transform well behaved under diffeomorphisms of your of your sigma. So this is the special case where M is a mapping cylinder. So, so for example, if you have a torus, then SL2Z acts on this torus. But of course, the, the correlation function should only depend on the complex structure of the torus, not on the presentation of the torus as C square modular lattice. And this actually you can see on the topological field theory side. So we always have this map, this action of the mapping class group on the space Z sigma, but what it actually means is that the space, for example, for a torus, Z of a torus, so I'm always writing genus here and number of punctures here. So this is a torus, genus one and zero punctures. The torus depends, its complex structure depends on tau. Um, and, and this this space of functions contains the, the characters of the modules of the of the uh, of this field theory. Um, and, and they transform under the mapping class group. And, and transform means if you if you replace this, uh, so so by SL2Z of this, so you really act in, so you really act on the functions like this, and you replace the function by by this function, then actually you should get some linear combinations again of these functions, right? Or that is maybe something like e to the i pi tau. So, so and, and, and this here is the finite dimensional action of SL2Z on, on this finite vector space. So somehow we see this action, but we don't see the function. So we don't see this, but there is like a, a, a matching analytical description. And that's actually why we expect this action and why we have it. And hence also the name modular tensor category, which uh, it's a fun thing to ask a PhD student who made a PhD about modular tensor categories. You ask why it's called modular, Good. all kinds of interesting answers. Um, so yes, so that's maybe the nutshell. Let's now uh, look at just to give you an impression. I mean, I'm not going to, but we are, we'll recover this example. But just to give you an impression, this category that we had, so so Zn graded vector spaces and this braiding with the root of unity, 
which we always have on the blackboard. It corresponds to a group boson to the chiral part. So again, just the solomorphic part. And in this case, compactified. That's why I have a finite group here. We'll talk about this later more. And these spaces, this TFT, that the TFT would assign to this an n-dimensional space. And what this actually is, is a space of the, the characters that you get for these representations on the, on the physics side. Um, and these look like, like this. So we will see why this is, but uh, so these are theta functions divided by eta functions. And if you now take one of these elements here associated to this, it's so basically on the, on the hop algebra side, you think it's the character of this representation, but it's really a function like this. And if you take the character and you replace this by an SL to Z action, then you get some linear combination of these characters. And this is this finite dimensional representation of SL to Z on Z. So just in a nutshell, that's maybe what what happens. And I, I want to try to explain this now even a little bit more. And as I said, if I go on a tangent, then this is not good for you to just forget the next 10 minutes, but I will try. And if, yes, if you have questions, please ask. Please. Oh, please. So in one side, you have right set 10, and that's the modular category. Yeah. On the left side, when you say free boson, it says. Mm -hmm. When you say free boson, it's a CFT. Exactly. To that. exactly. And so for any n, you have the same CFT. No, because it's compactified. Thanks for the question. That's exactly the kind of questions you should ask because uh, it, it, that's what we hope to clarify, I think. So free boson would be actually something like uh, R-graded vector spaces. So it's not really modular because it's very, very large. We will see in the example later, but so it's like R-graded vector spaces. It has a similar R matrix with, with E to the I pi and so on. And now what you do when you compactify is you somehow divide other lattice. That's how lattice view A's arise. And that gives you different Z ends. So different ends are different compactivity. And, yeah. and it has to be a specific type of value for, for the compactification rate. It's not arbitrary. Yes. Yes, of course. You have to do all these things very carefully. Um, yes. So let's let's now look. As I said, maybe that's a, a frivolous game, but let's a little bit try to, to see more what happens on this on this physics side. As I said, I'm not the expert in this room on this, but I will nevertheless try to explain. So, so what we had also, I think yesterday on the blackboard basically is uh, there's one formulation of classical physics. So that's one example of where you get all these from, or maybe the main example. Um, so variational physics means sort of, sort of as follows. So which, which, if you have a particle in say some force field or whatever, which, which path does it take? Well, it takes the one where a certain functional is minimized. That's one way of formulating physics. And it's maybe not the not the way you were used in school, but that's the one you can do, and actually a very nice one uh, from the maybe 18th century. Um, they, they discovered that all their equations are equivalent to this variation problem. And so that's some function that says it depends, of course, on the value of the path and all the derivatives, maybe. And then you integrate this over all time. And this is somehow a, a I don't know. You could say how good the path is, right? It's called an action. Maybe that word somehow causes a lot of confusion sometimes, the reasons, of course, or the Lagrangian. So it's a way how I evaluate how this path as a function, how good I find this. And if you if you take this minimalization condition, and that's equivalent to the order Lagrange differential equation, then you can more or less sort of recover recover physics principles from this when you, you get differential equations for your for your path. And I'll see an example later. And there is, for example, in this time, there was this uh, de Kron problem, right? You know, where you try, which is the fastest way down a hill and so on. So there's problems like this that they have solved with this technology. And there's also this famous Perma principle, which predates this, which was the principle that there's one way of explaining how light diffracts is, I mean, you can somehow go to a global point of view and say, light, light is slower in glass than it is in, in air. And what you can find is actually the formulas are like that the path light takes is the fastest. So this sounds, of course, stupid because how can the light know here what is here? But that's sort of our point of view. So in this variational perspective, light somehow can, can, can think all these different paths, but it's, it's better to be a little bit longer in air because I'm faster. But if I'm going too long, then I've taken a detour, which is too, too much. Hmm? This, the need should be fixed, right? Sorry? This is not variable, right? So somehow you should fix this and this, and then and then you think, so if you're here, then you are very long in air, but, but you take a large detour. And if you go straight, then you are too long in glass. So somehow there's an optimal mixture depending on how fast you are here and how fast you are here, and that's the optimal mixture. And it's some R principle somehow predates this. So it's just, you look which is the shortest path. And and now what you do when you when you go to quantum quantum uh, world is somehow you replace this by a, by a random experiment. So here we take the minimum. 
classic is the minimum. And now what path integration very, very, very roughly means is the, the path you take or a field, I mean, how, how strong is your field somewhere or whatever. I mean, these are functions with certain certain values, maybe in R or in manifolds as in the last talk or so. Um, I somehow consider them to be random. So it's, I think it's like, it's, it's a random path and, and it has a certain amplitude and a certain probability that depends on how good I find this path. So somehow uh, paths that have a very large Lagrangian, I don't find very good. So they are very improbable. And this improbable is sort of is a, factor, a factor e to the minus of this. So, so somehow, yeah. And, and now, of course, of course, in sort of usually it behaves very much like in the minimum. But it can sort of, it has a freedom to, to do something else, uh, but it's very improbable. Somehow everything can happen, but it's more and more improbable the, the, the weirder it gets. And what we are, so, so, so I imagine this really very, very roughly as like a, like a random experiment. I mean, it's like a random path or a random field, and then you're asking statistical questions about so statistical questions. So what we are interested are in particular the expectation values. So this is what they put in brackets. So if you have some question, an observable O is actually a question on this function. If you have some question, you can look what the expectation value is. Which means really you take the expectation values over all possible phi, weighted by the probability or by the amplitude to be correct of the value of this. So for example, I can ask what is the value in a specific point? So I can get the expectation value of phi at a point Z1. So I want the expectation value of, of this value. Or maybe I want the expectation value of the products of phi in several points. And that's what you get, for example, to, to, to calculate how much they're correlated. And that's what the name correlation function comes from. And uh, there is a very similar thing, which I'm not going to talk about, but where you replace this factor actually by, by thermodynamic thing. So also temperature does something like that. So if, it's, if stuff is very cold, then only what happens is the, prop, the most probable thing. And if it's very hot, then somehow this factor is not very bad and everything can happen. Yeah, please. I think there's a question. Please. Uh, yes. Uh, in your expectation, you, you, so you, you take your integral over all time, but you take also an integral over x over the time? And, well, the integral over x is somehow here. Okay. I mean, here I ask a question about x. This is not necessarily an integral. Like I ask, for example, the value of x at some point. I could also ask here the integral of x. I mean, I can ask any question about x. It's, it's like a random variable, right? I mean, you have your space. You have your you have your space of all phi's, maybe from maybe from R two to R or something, or from R to R the paths, and 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 from this an observable is just some map to maybe R. So for example, I send a phi to phi z for z fixed, or yes, you could also ask phi goes to maybe the integral of phi. It's not an observable in the quantum in the quantum mechanical sense. It's a... Phi is a classical function. Uh, so in the case of uh, for me, the, the classical physics observable is this kind of stuff, and in quantum mechanics, observable is a linear parabola. No, that's how you how you that's how you quantize the classical observable. So that's the classical observable. And you so want to okay. find the expectation value directly without having to write on an operator. So you, you're right that in some sense there will be an operator on a Hilbert space later. Okay. But this is the, the classical observable. So you, you directly write down sort of the quantum. That's the cool thing. I mean, this is of course very ill-defined in, in several senses, but it's a it's it's a cool thing that you can sort of start with your classical question that you have and you immediately get like the quantum answer without having to introduce operators and stuff. So like this formula X is uh, it's not really a variable, it's uh, it's just it's just a symbol. No. This x, yeah. No, this is a position. Sorry? This is x is a point. It's missing an integration of x. Which, 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 which? Uh, okay. Where is the integration missing? You, you have to integrate over x as well as t to get the action. It's the action which appears. Oh, uh, here, up here. Yeah, that's the action. He has the integral, but, but no. you couldn't maybe use the same x in the mm -hmm. in the variable there as in the observable. I'm not understanding. Okay. I think I integrate here with T. But, uh, it's not a big deal. I just want okay. to understand what was the role of X in the formula. It was a variable. It was yeah. a goal, it was a... Oh, 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 yeah. Here, here, X is just, I mean, phi of X just means phi as a function. Maybe okay. I should have written phi here. Mm, okay. So that's maybe that abuse of abuse of writing okay. F of X when you actually mean the function F. Okay. Yes, I mean, here, that's a good point. Yes, sorry. You're right. So here should be said phi. And here we should say phi. And here we should say X as a function. Okay. Yeah. What, what does the D represent? 
Well, the D represents that you you you, you like to integrate over space. Oh, that's, that's, that's fair. I'm not used to it being like a script a math cow D. So it's like, what does yeah, that, that mean? That, that's, uh, <laughs> So this, of course, is very ill-defined that I'm the wrongest person to ask how this would be defined as some functionality people who maybe know. But, uh, but of course, in these TFT state sum models, so you're exactly doing that, right? You somehow have a triangulation of the manifold and you somehow go over all like random functions on it uh, in some sense. Right? So, so this is this is um, this is sort of the the in a, in a very nutshell uh, how how things go. I think once you've seen this, if you don't ever saw this, you should have seen this like once at least a little bit. Um, and let's see how this example looks like. So what is called a, a free field. Is you, I mean, putting a CFT basically says, or a quantum field theory is, I, I start with some Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian I start, and the easiest case is this. So now this phi is maybe a function from some two dimensional surface to R, maybe, or it can be d dimensional or whatever. And uh, how I value my function is I take the gradient, the absolute value, and integrate this. So, so, so somehow a function is good if the overall gradient square is as small as possible it's like a, a way of saying when a function is good and if you look what the minimum is or the Lagrange equation you get the wave equation so waves are sort of the optimal answer to that question but now in the quantum sense you have a random function which sort of wants to be a wave it wants to be close to this minimum but it can be something else and it gets sort of punished by by low probability and then you can compute what are what are the correlation functions and here you get it. I mean, what is the correlation function of what the function is at some point? The expectation value is zero by symmetry, right? There's no reason why there should be a more probable to be positive or negative value of the function. So it's the, the average value of the function or of the derivative baby of the function at a point Z is just zero for symmetry reasons. But here, this tells us something of, if I take a random field, how much is the value at Z1 and Z2 correlated? So I could use this to express the correlation function, this minus this times this. So this basically tells you how much if I measure two places and I take the product of the values, um, is that completely uncorrelated or is there some, some dependency? And if you compute this, you get this result. So you see the further the points are away, the less they are correlated. That's what you should get. And then here from symmetry reasons, again, it's zero. And here you get this typical, you get some contribution from these correlating and these correlating, but there is basically all the correlators here come from here. And that's a little bit what makes a free field theory that that sort of that's the only really interesting correlator and all correlators here somehow come from here. In more complicated theories, there's maybe more complicated uh, terms here. Very nut. Right. Um, let's also go to because I mean, this is, I think, the st standard example that we have in mind. But let's also go to a very, very different example just to see how universal that is. Apart from this, from this. So we can play the following game. So I know we'll go completely away from, from quantum field theory. The following game. Let's, let's take a rectangle with corners, z1, z2, z3, z4. And I fill it with some hexagonal lattice, which I imagine to, I want to become very small. And I color each hexagon randomly with black or white. So I put randomly colors on this. This is a statistical game I can play. And now the question, I can ask many questions about this statistical model. I can ask, for example, how probable is it that I have a closed path from the left to the right? And for finite uh, grid, this is some number that you get, which is maybe complicated to get combinatorically. Uh, but in the limit, it's kind of clear what happens. I mean, you're not going to get it. If you color 20%, then there is sort of no way of, of getting on, a, on the color black from left to right. Just there's little islands. There is no, no way. But I can now ask, what is the probability? And what is the limit of the probability, depending on how many percentages are black? So 20% are black, then I'm quite sure that there is no way. And in the finite case, there is some probability, but in the infinite limit, there is no. So if I go up 40, it seems more probable, but it's still back in the limit, there is no way. And if I color 60%, then I easily find a path. And if I color 80%, then I mean, very surely I find a path. So some of the feeling is that at 50%, somehow it, it flips, right? If you have more than 50% black dots, then it's very easy to get a path. And if it's below, it's very hard. And in the limit, that's a zero one law. And the result is actually as follows. So the result is that the following, and you see already, it comes from quantum field theory. The following formula was, was uh, conjectured. There is some critical probability, which depends in fact on which lattice you take, which model you take and so on. But the, the, the conjecture is that there exists a critical probability, in our case, 50%, such that below the probability zero, above it's one. And if it's exactly critical, then it's some non-trivial expression here. 
And this involves here, for example, this uh, hypergeometric function and some z to the one third. And what we see is, for example, that several things from the physical perspective. So what we see is that we expect that that there is this p which maybe depends on our model we could also do this with random graphs or so with different lattices that the p crit will depend on that but the rest of the formula should be completely independent of the model so it should be true for every lattice for example what is the set in your picture the what the, the variable set here that's the next sentence i'd say no, well, 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 uh, those were the corners of the oh. of the rectangle sorry Thanks. sorry um so, so the second thing is we expect that in the limit, it does not depend on Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, but it only depends on that cross ratio, which is because it only depends on the on up to conformal transformations. In fact, it doesn't even have to be a rectangle. It, it can be some other form, uh, but then you have to use a conformal transformation, a holomorphic map to, to make it a rectangle, and then you can use the formula. And in fact, that's where you get this formula one from, um, because you can transform it to a triangle, and then the formula looks very easy. <laughs> so. so um, so somehow this is big just because of the direct angle. Um, and, and Smirnov uh, proved, so that was a Fields medal, proved that this is true, this conjecture for the hexagonal lattice for 50% is critical value. But you would expect that something that is true always. And that somehow this like physical idea that sort of whenever you ask a well enough post question, maybe I'm now overstating it, but whenever you ask like a, a well, well post question about some systems in the critical limit, then they will sort of be universal. So they will not depend on the details, but just somehow have a universal law and and it will be conformal invariant in some sense. So that's sort of an expectation that you have in several questions you ask. And now I can ask here other questions. I can ask, for example, so I, I did very, very long time ago in Munich, I did a talk about this. Proof. You can ask questions. So the proof really here goes by by reformulating this in terms of like Cauchy, uh, Cauchy Riemann equations and so on. Actually quite fun, but maybe not our topic. But so you can, for example, ask something like fix a point. What is the probability to go over the point? And of course, this will depend on where the point sits. So I can like, start asking different questions and I get sort of answers in the model. And these are all the observables of the theory. So you can relate them to observables. So and somehow, somehow that's what, what happens. So, so and the fact why he conjectured this is because he expects or he expected that critical percolations so or percolation theory in the critical case all these different observables that you can ask. Also, for example, you can ask how probable are big or small clusters. That's one thing we talked about in the seminar at this time. And they all should be observables of, a, of an abstract conformal field theory, which is called 2,3 model. So, so the idea is somehow that there is several different questions you can ask, but each of them leads to a, actually, because it's very restrictive, each of them leads to the, the same set of correlation functions that you have. This is sort of the universal thing. So somewhere like on one abstraction layer. And this is the conformal field theory 2,3. And we will only talk about P, comma 1, but I think uh, Sogimoto talked about. This is the same as in Sogimoto's talk, right? This is P, P0, comma P1. So I only talked about P, comma 1. So this is why this is not so, not so true what I write. It's much more complicated than P, comma 1 even, but sort of the very rough idea is that you have this conformal field theory, which is somehow universal, and it has a representation theory with certain irreducibles, in this case, it has a non-exact tensor product, which makes it more complicated, but it's nevertheless a good modular tensor category. And it's, in this case, loosely related to the quantum group SL2 at a two-third root of unity. And you see the two-third, it's no accident. And you see the third root of unity here is no accident. So you see here in the brain appearing somehow. So this is not completely true because this here is not an exact tensor product. So there's just a big quotient, which is the quantum group and so on. But so more or less, this is the picture in this case. So I bring it because I can motivate the, the example. So this was now a long introduction. But so is, there, is there questions to this? Yeah. Do you know that this one is a modular tensor category? No, I don't know. Because we said it, right? No. Oh. So, I'm just talking on level of expectations. I only have, I all have this from the article of you with Terry, right? So <laughs> it's in many, many senses. So there is the unit is not simple. I mean, it's interesting to study this because it's like beyond the cases we usually have. The unit is not simple. The tensor uh, product is not exact. Uh, you have probably just this groton degradier duality that, that that's, uh, yeah, you folks talked about and stuff like that. Not talked about, but, uh, oh, but well, not talk about it, but uh, work on. Sorry. Um, yeah. Is this a correlation model to approximate the pass? Problem you were mentioning before. Yes. Well, now it's discrete and you. It's always the limit. 
So you ask, you ask some combinatorical problem. The answer is some stupid combinatorical function, which I cannot compute. But in the limit where I make the mesh smaller and smaller, in physics there's a thermodynamical limit. So somehow stuff becomes universal in the critical points. And, 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 and the behavior there, that's an analytic function in Z. So here, it depends, for example, on Z to ask how probable it is to have a path which goes over this point and doesn't use the below. Like this questions like this give you functions in Z. And, and the easiest function I've given you, it's just depending on the cross ratio of the, the rectangle. And I want to recover this function, right? We understand what, what this function, how this plays with the other functions that you have. And the probability um, uh, which appears in the percolation. Sorry? Uh, this uh, uh, peak, which appears yeah. in the percolation model uh, doesn't appear in the continuous. Uh... No, no. Uh, good, good question. That's exactly what not appears. So the, the idea is that. The P, the P, the critical P. Okay. So there will be a critical P. Below it's boring and above it's boring. That's the critical uh, speculation where something non trivial happens. And, and the critical P depends on the model. So if you take a triangular lattice, I forgot what it was, but I knew it at some point. So it's still an open question, actually. Um, for a triangular lattice, uh, there should be a different critical P. And if you take a model of a random graph with some branch law, it's also a different critical P. But the expectation is that the limit always has exactly this formula, independent of the P. That's, that's the idea. And that's the conformal, that's sort of the conformal field theory you see, completely independent of quantum field theory. Yeah. Uh, is, is this some interpretation of the 13 very useful modules in the in terms of population? You're asking the wrong person. So can maybe, maybe, maybe you can ask Thomas, but I don't know if you have. Can I make a comment? Please, please. So the percolation that you've presented has boundaries. Mm -hmm. right? You're on a finite rectangle. And so this means that uh, the conformal field theory that you should be considering as a boundary conformal field theory. So what you've presented as W23 is actually a conjecture for the bulk conformal field theory. Mm -hmm. So in order to describe Cardi's formula in terms of conformal field theory with the boundaries, then the boundary conditions have to break the W symmetry. And so you end up with something which is conjectured to be just Virasoro. So you get uh, mm -hmm. universal Virasoro with C equals zero plus the, uh, as the vertex I over to us here. So I don't think you can describe okay. Riccardi's formula using a W symmetry. And so the modularity, if it even exists, may not even be relevant to this. Uh, to this calculation. Ah, so you have to ask questions that do not involve the boundary. So questions like, I don't know, cl cluster cluster size, or which, yes, which sort of questions would be would be related to exactly the, the VUA 2.3? So there are uh, generalizations of uh, Schramm-Lohner evolution. I think they call them conformal loop ensembles. Mm -hmm. And these are strictly in the bulk. And so you can ask questions like, you know, if you have, you know, two points here, and you have a, uh, a percolation uh, path which encircles both of them, or which you know goes between ah. two of them and then come. So you can ask questions which don't involve any boundary. Ah, okay. So, yeah. so th then this was strictly not true what I'm saying, but it's very good that I learned this. So that means, yeah. The has no connection to the No, I don't. Uh, no, there is a conjecture, but uh, it's not accepted by everybody. Okay. I mean, there is some of those information you can map on the one speed chain. Yes, this is another yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. This is speed chain, yeah. right? And then I have a paper when we I studied know. this about theory, and it, it has it's very different from about theory for W2.3. Ah, okay. okay. But, but it's a good point that we actually, I, I, I was wrong about this, so with the boundaries, but it's good that we had the term boundary conditions because I always also ask what. So boundary conditions on the on the on on this side of the module categories, right? Yeah. Yeah. And somehow yeah. I have no clue how to do this, but somehow what you said should yeah, say something about the model category. The point is they break the W symmetry. Yeah. So instead of having 13 boundary conditions, you have an infinite number. Right. And you need that in order to explain the uh, non-local, uh, what we call crossing probability. Very good. Yeah. Can you recommend some paper on that? Uh, or you can recommend some of Cardi's old papers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think can you really recommend them <laughs> to the audience? No. Okay. Yeah, I have to look because I want to understand this better. Yeah. But so at least there is some. So let's agree that uh, that's somehow the ideas that we have at the back of our head. And as I said, I'm probably not the smartest person in this respect, but I nevertheless try. So let's now make a. That was the motivation part. Let's now make a, a long line and start to introduce VUAs. Okay, any more questions on this? The other example. So we already had several times on the blackboard, a vertex operator algebra is a commutative algebra 
where, so in my perspective, I always say it roughly like this, where the multiplication map depends on a variable Z. So I have two elements, I assign to it a Laurent series with coefficients again in V. So that's uh, the easiest, uh, the roughest, roughest way I can state what it should be. Um, and the second datum is a, an action of the Vila Soro algebra. So this is this Lie algebra with this relation. And um, in fact, if you where this comes from is you can look at the Witt algebra. So this is the algebra of uh, differential with some Z power. If you look at these commutators, it's the formula without the Z. So this acts on, on complex variables, on, on power series. So somehow you want that if you act with this central extension here and here and here, and in this way here, you want these four actions to be compatible, right? Like to intertwine this action in some sense. <laughs> and uh, especially L0 gives the grading that we will now from now on always have. And L minus one is a sort of derivation, a translation operator. And this is of course uh, uh, that we want conformal invariance. And this commutativity and assertivity hold up to formal delta functions. And uh, this is, of course, a very deep stuff where you have to do a lot of calculations, but let's leave this completely for now, for a second. So, so that's actually the interesting part of the theory is that this is not really commutative and associative, but there are some delta functions appearing. Physically means that they commute like outside of, in different places. Maybe not places, but momenta or something like that. Um, Yes, so the way I stated it, it's, it's pretty obvious how I would state what a module is, right? You just place this in this by M. That's a way how V now acts, how sends M to a power series in M. So a module is uh, very roughly a vector space M together with a map from V to M to M, again with power series and again with the Rezolo algebra actions. So I think that's quite, in this notation, it's quite suggestive what a, what a module should be. Um, and then there's this big theorem uh, that says, if V is, has a certain finiteness condition, so it's C2 cofinite, then representations of V in this sense give you a braided tensor category. And in particular, if we know it's semi-simple and the unit is self-dual, uh, then we know it's modular. So we would somehow expect if it's non-semi-simple and the unit is not self-dual, then it's non-semi-simple modular with some local degree duality, but maybe that's uh, something. But so that there's supposed to be something like that true, but you have to find the right statement somehow. So, so one proof this really by using the Valente formula in the semi-simple case. So I mean, this proof I think does not carry over so easily. Um, so and now I wanna look a little bit more into this statement so that, that you see how this braiding actually looks like. Uh, so how, suppose you have these like algebras and, and modules up to a variable Z, how do you get a braiding in a tensor a product? I think that's an important uh, thing to understand it very roughly. So, so what you have to define is an intertwiner between three modules. And this is a map that goes from M, N to L. And now it depends on fractional powers of Z and it depends on logarithms of Z. So in fact, what it means is it's a regular singularity, but maybe multivalent. So this is a little bit more general than what we had before. And uh, the, the axioms are in a way that you should imagine this is a V balanced map. So somehow if you act with V here, it's the same as acting with V here, it's the same as acting with V here. It's like a V balanced map if you have modules over commutative algebra. That's, I, I stick very close to this analogy to commutative algebras because that's how I understand it. I'm sure there's other interpretations. So, and now uh, suggestive from what I said, you can imagine how I want to define a tensor product, at least the idea. So the tensor product, I wanna define as having the property that you have such a balanced map from M tensor N into it. And it should be the universal object. So whenever you have an intertwiner from M tensor N into something, there should be a map from the tensor product into this object. So it's, it's the same you would do for commutative ring, right? Um, and, and now for a commutative ring, uh, it's immediately the tensor product uh, is again commutative because you can switch the tensor factors and acting here is the same as acting here, so it's fine over a commutative ring. We don't talk about bimodules here, really commutative ring. But now here it's a little bit more complicated. We can define a braiding, which goes roughly as follows. If M tensor N and you have N tensor M. So I have to give two intertwiners of this type and I can replace Z by minus Z. But if I do that, I have to be careful that I'm now in a multi-valued setting. So in this intertwiner, I, I analytically continue Z to minus Z to go to the other side. And that gives me a braiding. But now if I take another braiding, I get at the same point Z again, but I, I, I go to round zero one time, I go around zero one time. So that's why the double braiding is more or less measuring 
no, not more or less, I mean, the double rating measures exactly how multi-valued this function is. So if it's a single valued, then, then double rating is trivial. What the braiding is depends on your choices, right? And this, uh, which intertwiners you take, but the double braiding is universal and it tells you this. So, so we defined the, the, the take home statement. If you've never seen this, is maybe we define the tensor product uh, like for a commutative ring. And, and because it's now multi valued analytic functions, we have a braiding and we have maybe an associator. It's sort of the very rough statement. This is how the tensor category looks like. And I will show you an example. So, the first example is um, let's take again this free, free field. So, so in this case, the vector space, I keep to physical notation actually to really keep in, keep in touch with the, the example that we had at the beginning with the free field. So I have this, this phi, which was a random field. And the questions I can ask are, what is the value of phi, which I don't include for because it's logarithmic, but what is the value of d phi, d square phi, and so on. These are questions I can ask. And this sort of algebra of observables is now an infinite dimensional vector space. And it's the polynomial ring generated by these symbols. So an arbitrary element there is maybe two times d phi plus five times d square phi plus 12 times d phi d phi. So it's like just a polynomial in these infinitely many variables. And it's graded. This is in degree one, this is in degree two, and so on. So this is a graded infinite dimensional vector space. And the typical example of how the vertex operator looks like is if I now multiply sort of d phi and d phi, what I get is one with set to the minus two. That's the interesting part where they talk to each other. And there is a part where they don't talk to each other, where basically that d phi is here, and that d phi maybe gets some more derivations and is here. And there is so this has to be for translation variant, so it's compatible with L minus one. But so more or less here it's when these two don't talk to each other. So this is now a quadratic element in here. But this is the interesting part. It's also the one with the singularity. And then, uh, as we saw in several talks, you can try to define a bit of solo action, which basically means you write down uh, an element. And such that the power expansion. So I imagine this now as endomorphisms of V, that this has the relations of the Vita Soto algebra. And in fact, what you usually take is this one. This would be exactly, if you remember, we had the Lagrangian where, where there was this D phi square, right? This was our L of phi. And this, this like really has to do with that. You take this here. Um, and no, this is wrong. There's d phi square. So this square should be here. I'm sorry. So you take this. We paste error. But you can also introduce with some parameter q this, this additional d square phi. So second derivative. You can, you can add. I'm not sure. So this is my question to the experts. Uh, does that just mean I introduce here something like this? No, it's more difficult, right? You couple it to the scalar curvature of the manifold. Means? Can you say a term? You couple it to the scalar curvature. You have to say a term for that. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you what what does that mean in, uh, in this language? So uh, there, should, it should, there should be some term here, which I don't understand that corresponds to this joint. So here you have sort of a, a one parameter family of Vila Soto actions. And uh, yeah. what is already non trivial is you can now analyze how this Vila Soto algebra acts on this space using this. That's something we will need a couple of times more. So uh, first of all, how does the space look like as a graded vector space? First, ignore the, the errors, right? So there is a one, which is the one in this polynomial ring. There is d phi. Then at degree two, there is two basis vectors, namely d square phi and d phi square. So these are the two elements in here of degree two. And then it goes on, right? Um, and now I can ask how these LNs act. So for example, L minus one just act like a derivation. So L minus one is the blue here, uh, acts from D phi to D square phi. This is what L minus one does, it's a derivation. Or L minus one of one is zero. So it doesn't, the, the, the error here just means it goes to nothing. So you already see that this is not something like a highest weight module. It's not like I start with one and I apply my Ls. So if I apply L minus two, I get this guy, or maybe this combination, because that's exactly what it is. L minus two is sort of this. So here it's, I think, Q equals zero. So L minus two gives me something, but L minus one will be zero. And on the other hand, this vector here is a new highest weight vector. But if you apply L one, it goes in this direction. 
So you somehow see that this has a non-trivial substructure. So, so the outer part, which is sort of generated by one, is a submodule. And then there is uh, here, if you divide this out, you get a quotient module, which is this here. And here it's again a submodule and so on. So there is this alternating kind of composition series. Is that kind of clear? Yeah. So you can study how this decomposes as a module using the LNs. This is a game you can play. And this we will need in a second. Are you sure it's not d5 squared? Yeah, exactly. Here it's d5 squared. Ah, okay. Yeah. I noticed that when I... <laughs> ah, okay. I, I, I know, of course, but it's because, because here it's d squared fine. I just, I think I just okay. copied it wrong. So yes, it's d5 squared. It's the usual term. And here it's d5 squared. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Y
I, I think other ones should remove the end. Okay, I can I can I can say it's a it's a tensor infinite infinite non semisimple tensor category with a non degenerate braiding, but saying modular means to have dualities, having modular actions and so on. And this is in this case, of course, because it's infinite. So but the, this is this is also infinite, but it also has yeah. There are two students of Dimokto who have studied this, and it's quite actually relevant for physics. Ah, very good. So you can, I, I can give you the reference. Yeah, please, 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 because I think this is a very, I mean, it's, it's difficult. I think, of course, the, the small quantum group is like the smallest non semi simple finite dimensional example, but it's already quite complicated. So somehow I, I try to have examples that maybe do not have all features, but they are sort of much, much, much easier in some sense. And this may be one of them. Okay. No, but I'm very happy about comments like this. So uh, then we are on a different ground here. Mm. Yes, so this is the example we have in mind. So this is the Heisenberg algebra as a modular tensor category. And this is the main player of what we do now. Uh, just as an example, if you work out now really exactly how DeFi and another DeFi act, you can really work this out. You get some sum with the formulas I gave you, you get some sum. And if you sum this right you get z1 minus z2 to the minus two so you really get the correlation function i put on one of the early slides right remember you had this uh, we had this function that said uh, d phi of z1 d phi of z2 is one over z1 minus z2 square so you could really really get this from from the y's just to see one time that this really works so if you go back it's more or less this z to the minus two that you really see. You can also now look at uh, on the tools. So you take traces, you can take trace. And what you here get is more or less uh, an, an eta function because that's how the, that's how the, the graded dimension is. It's, it's one dimensional, one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional so partition function, so partitions of N. If you just work out what the, what the, uh, what the, I mean, what this is in the green effect space. You get the eta function at Hilbert series. And this is of course, not a modular form, but close. And if you next example, we do a lattice VOA, so we compactify it, we get a theta function, eta function. And that was, again, this example that we had on the second slide. So you really get this information from what I give you. Maybe that's the only thing I want to say. Yes. So let's now go to lattice. So a construction that I will also tomorrow do a lot. Um, let A be a commutative algebra. Now I'm using tensor category language again. Let A be a commutative algebra in a braided tensor category. Not a Hopf algebra, a commutative algebra. Then the local modules of A with a tensor product over A give again a modular tensor category. And local modules here mean that uh, if you braid once and you braid twice and you act, that's the same as directly acting. So you, this is a construction you can do. So we had several constructions how you get from tensor categories to other tensor categories. One was taken modules over a Hopf algebra in the category, and one is taken modules over a commutative algebra with a tensor product over this commutative algebra. And again, this is like in like in usual algebra, right? You have two, two sources of tensor categories, modules over a commutative ring with tensor product over the ring, or modules over a Hopf algebra with tensor product over the ground field. So the two, two examples you have. And this is now the second. Um, and from this, you can start, and that's a fun exercise, which we will not do thoroughly here, but, but it's, I think it's very instructive. You can really start to start with this tensor category and try to find commutative algebra. So more or less a commutative algebra in here is an integral lattice. So it's a set of elements in C to the N which have integral scalar product and which are additively closed. The algebra structure is kind of clear. It's the multiplication of the map, I mean, the, the adding, adding vectors in the lattice. And the modules are the modules are cosets, right? Because if you add with the algebra, you shift by lambda. And they are local if this is in the dual lattice, because then they have an integral Right, remember the braiding was e to the i pi lambda mu. And, and if and if mu mu goes to the lattice, then lambda should go to the integral lattice, and then the double braiding is trivial. So those are the local modules. And what you get is now for an even integral lattice, there is a lattice vertex algebra, which is now you take the Heisenberg algebra and a lot of its modules. So so the Heisenberg algebra itself, but then also maybe e lambda and e minus lambda. You take all of these modules for lambda out of the lattice, sum them together, and then the category you get is not C graded vector spaces or C to the N graded vector spaces, but lambda star over lambda graded vector spaces. <clears throat> this is compactification we discussed at the very beginning briefly. 
Um, and the braiding now is again the same as before, but careful now the value of this braiding up to a sign depends a little bit on which representatives you take. So now you have a problem with representatives and that therefore you usually have a non-trivial three cycle, or well, not usually, but sometimes. And you should study this with quadratic forms. As in the example I said at the beginning, you have an abelian group in a quadratic form. The quadratic form here is clear. The quadratic form is e to the i pi lambda lambda. And now writing them a braiding like that depends on choices. And, but the double braiding does not depend on choices. The double braiding is just e to the i pi lambda mu with a two. So these are the invariant stuff and the braiding depends on choices. Let's quickly see how this picture looks like. So how I draw these pictures is always the lattice goes in X direction. And as before, the L0 goes in Y direction. So this is the guy we had at the beginning. This is the Heisenberg algebra. And now I add this module and I add this module and this module and this module, right? So this is now my big view A. Here for the lattice square root two Z, so some one dimensional lattice. And, and it, now if you look at this picture hard enough, uh, if you draw it like that, it's quite suggestive. And it, you somehow ask yourself whether this submodule structure here maybe comes, I mean, I mean, for example, you had here a submodule, right? This outer part. You ask whether this maybe comes from the fact that you have maps in horizontal direction. So this would explain it. So if we have a map from here to here, this would explain why this here is a submodule because it's the kernel of this map. And that's actually what screenings are for. So you see that the substructure is not random, but it comes from the fact that here you have a screening and that tells you that you should be a submodule. And here you have a screening that tells you that this should be a submodule. And here you have a screening, which tells you that, uh, no, this one you don't, I think. <laughs> no, but uh, well, you have one. I think this is zero, but here you have one that tells you this is a submodule and so on. So it tells you about this substructure. And these are the screenings in the way, I mean, screenings were I think known before by Totsenko and so on, but I think this is the way screenings appear in this famous Fagin-Fuchs paper from the 80s. So you expect to have maps like this that preserve the L0 and they preserve the module structure of these modules, uh, but, they, but they somehow shift the, the letter screening. And this is what we want to talk now. And I'm good on time, they're nice. So this was not my view introduction, now let's start the screenings. Yeah, please. So, uh, can you go back to your theorem? Yeah. I just wanted to say that, as you said, this is not quite right. What do you need? What do you need for? Well, uh, just you don't get a modular tensor category, but just a braided tensor category. And for modular, what do you need? Um, so, do you, you start with a non degenerate category and your algebra is, uh, has a non degenerate invariant parent? Yeah. Then you also get a modular tensor category. Uh, you want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so yeah, here, modular is non degenerate. Right. 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 He should be braided here. Yes, yes. Sorry. That's a mistake. Braided there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sure. modularity. And um, noted here somewhere. You start with modular and add a non degenerate invariant parent. So, there should be an MTC not for the RX. And there should be the boundary condition, and there should be no way. Just memorize it to change it later. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for the comment. Yes, of course. That's that. I mean, I cannot without assuming anything yeah, here. I cannot know something and here. If you change this, maybe you can write both statements because uh, that's, that's instructive, right? What can I write? I mean, the statement when you get a braided tensor category and when you get a modular tensor. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Yes, it's instructive. Yes, thanks, thanks very much. Exactly. And of course, this is so much. <laughs> exactly. Um, so this is the picture we should have in mind. And actually, uh, I have a picture like that hanging out of my uh, outside of my office, which some PhD student draw at some time. Uh, so I think this is sort of often. And, and if I, re I remember when I when I was the uh, first time in Moscow with Alyosha and, and Boris, so they uh, draw always these these hats. So it's somehow somehow for me for me this feels like <laughs> yeah. Um, took me a long time to understand what they mean with these hats, and at some point they explained it. So. Yes, they are exactly the substructure of these of these modules. These modules. So let's now try to explain these screenings. And uh, so now this was sort of my introduction in this topic. Um, so I I explain screenings the way I explain them. So there are several versions, and we can discuss them. But but that's how I would put it after after all of this, and uh, in hindsight maybe. So how I would define screenings, I think this is close to what you would do, but maybe some details are not. Um, so we'll let V be a view A and C the braided tensor category of representations. So suppose there's a nice category. Maybe V is C2 covalent, it doesn't have to be. Now let's fix a module. Then for all modules N, by definition of the tensor product, we have an intertwiner 
that goes from M tensor N to this. So this is an object. This is a great vector space. From M tensor N to this tensor product module with multi-valued function. So this I have by mere definition of the tensor product. And this is the only thing I can use now because I want to be very general. I don't want to be in specific examples. So now I fix any element in M. I can look at the at a map that somehow like left multiplication, right? I can fix M. Then I get a map from N to M tensor N with variable set by sort of fixing M. So it's like basically the map of left multiplication with V in some sense. But now I have this little set dependency. So now I integrate out this set dependency. And integrating out here means integrating on a lift of the unit circle in the multi-valued covering. So if I do this for a, so if, if, if M is the VUA, so if V is from the VUA, then here it's just the zero mode. But, but, in, but in general, um, I do this weird integration. Yeah, please. Question, uh, in the first place, set and log set are formal variables. At which point do you make them into a complex number? I mean, I mean, if you look, I mean, in, in, in EG's work, they are not formal variables. You should really think about them as as solutions of this differential equation with with with. Uh, so using this C two confinements and so on, that really functions with regular singularity at z equals zero. But I have to say, so so from my perspective, it, the, the the easiest quotation marks was to write down these things formal and then just check in the cases I have with convergence conditions that everything converges. So I did not try to set up some, some framework in which convergence was assured. One could try to do that. But I sort of really at the end, when I had a case, I just checked that the stuff converges. Because everything else, I don't know, I felt not comfortable with. I'm, I'm not very good with function analysis and stuff like that. So, so all the statements I will make have convergence checked, but not by some general abstract principle, but like <laughs> by checking at the end or in the middle or something, uh, using techniques from complex analysis. And in fact, to, to this paper I'm talking about later it took uh, roughly half a year to like, get all the analysis right. So I was, I'm not very experienced in that. And this converging stuff is, is not difficult, but it's annoying. But anyway, so, so, um, so this is, I think this is the main idea boiled down to something which, which is actually not so difficult. So left multiplication and then integrate it out. Yes? I have a really silly question. What is the what is the the variable the that 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 looks like a three bis knot? What 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 what? The 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 the, the for the map. What 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 symbol are you using? This. Yes. This is a Russian z or string. Thank you. But it's by the way at the same time a, a old German z. So that's actually a nice coincidence. I think. Huh? What is it? Z. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a coincidence for the naming. It's very nice that it's also German Z, but of course, it's not a coincidence. Yes, it's a uh, factor German Z, and in Russia, it's the the the, the voice Z. It's not Z, but Z. So when I was there, the people were always asking me, How do you pronounce your name? Is it Simon or Simon? And I noticed I never in my life thought about which of the two S's I would use. I think my grandma, she wanted to be nice, she said Simon. And if somebody was mad, mad at me, he said Simon. <laughs> I think it's uh, which S I use, I never thought about. Uh, and they haven't decided yet. I think in the passport they write S uh, and not Z. But I like this letter, yeah. For, uh, so this is a screening. Um, uh, is there a need of the not Z the, in the compression of the right hand side, right? Sorry? Yeah, they need the in the compression of the right hand side, right? Yes, 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 yes. I didn't put all these things. Of course, you have to be careful now. You do this, um, you get serious. And, and usually all of the all of the coefficients appear. So in fact, you land in some in some algebraic closure here. And this is no problem the first time you do it because it's graded. I mean, you get contributions in every degree. I will show you examples later. Um, but if you compose these, you have to check convergence, as I said. I mean, it's it's you, you have a map that goes from here to the closure and another map that goes from here to the closure. You you get infinite contributions. You, you have to I mean really write down analytic series. It's not. As I said, I did not spend, I should probably, I did not spend time to formalize how we do this. I just write down what I have and then I prove convergence and prove that the statements are true. But one should do this more sophisticated maybe. Yes, so just as an example, uh, we had this question before. So actually I give you all the formulas so you could do this as an exercise. So, um, so now I have here some e to the lambda and I take some screening associated to, what did I choose? E to the R. And I want to know what that is. Well, I have to know what the vertex operator is. This is this expression. It starts with Z to the alpha lambda, and then there is some uh, higher terms which come from the translation operator. Um, and now the question is, what is the residue of this in, in my generalized sense? 
And of course, if it's integral, then it's the z to the minus one mode. So if it's integral and positive, then it's zero because there is no z to the minus one. If it's integral and negative, then I have to see how big k has to be such that it's minus one. So it's some derivation. But the nicest case is if the scalar product is minus one, but, uh, but uh, in the other case, you get some derivative. Right, so this is something specific you can work out. But if it's not integral, then I get contributions from everywhere. And that's what you talk for said. You, you end up in some some, uh, right, uh, some algebraic closure. This is a, a, a bad infinite series, which is well defined because you're in a graded vector space. But it's I mean not not pretty at all. And and yeah. So so in particular, you see from already these two formulas, you basically see. I mean, remember our picture. So if you go from here, which is maybe minus. Let's make minus one, right? E to the minus one, or maybe even some convention. Um, and I go with the screening plus two. Then I have here minus one and here plus two, which tells me the scalar product is negative. So it has a chance to be something interesting. If I go in this direction, here, e, maybe E to the plus three, it's clear that it's going to be zero. But we see from the picture, it has to be zero anyhow, because where should it go? So maybe at least these little checks you can do that, that this makes sense, right? But here it's something completely weird. But we should, I nevertheless, propose we should think about it. Um, and now local screening. So local for me always means the V I start with, this element here, is from the vertex algebra, because then this is multi-value function, a uh, single value function. So in this case, local screenings, you can use the, the typical tools from VUA theory, OPE, and so on, and you can derive um, commutative relations between these screenings. So, so usually they give you some nice Lie algebra. For example, they give you the action of the Vera Soto algebra when you start with. So, in some sense, the derivation operator is this. I mean, I mean, L minus one is the residue of T. I mean, in some sense, L minus one is a screen. It's a screening of the energy momentum tensor. I mean, why not? Um, but so, so screenings give you usually actions of Lie algebras, maybe SL two action or something. Long screenings, as we had in other talks. Um, as long and, and of course now to add conditions um it commutes with a vera soro if v fulfills the following condition if v is a, a one eigenvalue it's an eigenvector of eigenvalue one under l zero and only higher ln's act as zero the primary field of conformal dimension one then you can prove that these operators also commute with vera soro this will not be true for the non-local screenings not i mean not just because i have more conditions but it's completely has no chance of being true. So non-local screening operators, I propose in very general setting, give you actions of Nichols algebras. And which brainings do you take? I mean, it's the only thing you have, right? You have a, a, a general tensor category. The only thing you have is the intertwiners that you have from the existence of the tensor product. And now the only algebra you can write down is the Nichols algebra of this module M of which you take your screening. And the only thing you have is the braiding that you get from the intertwiners. So it's somehow, it's, min, it's very minimal. I mean, you, you have nothing else to use. What else should you use? Um, and so I take the, the, the braiding that I have in the modular tensor category at V, the braiding tensor category. Yes, this is the next. So this is a meta statement. Although I, I'm quite sure, I'm actually, during Corona, I wanted to, to visit DG a second time and, and we tried to prove this at some point, but somehow the Corona went between that. But so the statement I have in a paper since some time is, in one example where you can check everything a little bit more explicit, namely in the lattice view A case. So in this case that I write down, which we need for, need for all these free field realizations. So if I'm in a free field theory, in the lattice view A, or in Heisenberg view A maybe, let numbers alpha one till alpha n be in C to the n. So now I maybe need more space in my blackboard. Oh yeah, more than enough time. Well, let's take more time. In this paper, the, the setting is as follows. So the view A is just Heisenberg which is enough for all lattice VOAs because what we're talking does not depend on how big the surrounding VOA is. The screenings are there anyhow because there's a module. Um, so we have the Heisenberg VOA, and now we take the screening associated to alpha i. So this is y of e to the alpha i. So I take specifically one of these vectors because it's easier to calculate with them because I want to be explicit. And I integrate this out. Where alpha i is something in my vector space. And now the statement is as follows. So uh, there is a condition on the scalar products, alpha i, alpha j, that ensures convergence. And this will be in the next slide when I'm more precise on the proof and so on. 
that ensures convergence. And then, uh, then these, and you don't even have to fix which ones you take, you can take any, alpha one till alpha n satisfy the algebra relations of the Nichols algebra with diagonal in this case, because it's a, a point of category, diagonal braiding qij e to the i pi alpha i alpha j. So it's really this Nichols algebra we talked Yesterday, all, all day, the diagonal cases. The condition that, that ensures they come from the next slide. Uh, okay. I didn't want to put all the technical stuff on the first slide, so but I, sh I should. I should. Uh, yeah, I should is put related this. with uh, no, this is for uh... No, no, no. So, so I will say, I will say this, but it's nevertheless, it's good to push me. But I would say this, nevertheless. So, um, so this only depends on the on the braiding. It depends on how much this is not integral. But there is some condition that depends really on the value. Of and if you look at these examples that, that Sugimoto taught, taught us, right, this uses incidence graph, for example, for, uh, with integers. So that changes the behavior. I mean, on the Nichols algebra side, you do not see any integers you put. But here it really is relevant, whether this is minus five or one. I mean, it's not, it's not irrelevant. And it's not just a convergence condition. It's, it's somehow, if it's not true, but I will give the examples, but if it's not true, then, then you get really larger algebras than Nichols algebra. You don't get the Nichols algebra, you get something larger. But in this case, uh, it's it always a pre-Nichols? It is by trivial cases always a pre-Nichols because it's always in the free algebra in these guys, right? Okay. I mean, yes, it is pre-Nichols, but uh, that's an empty statement. Uh, the more interesting question I might add is, is it exactly the Nichols algebra? Because basically I'm just showing it some quotient of the Nichols algebra. And this is, I think, an interesting question, which I did not try to answer, but the rough idea is as follows. You see that you see even the the co-algebra structure actually. So the screenings do not act as derivations, but but somehow close to it, or derivations on these end products and so on. So the screenings have some derivation property. And now, if I'm allowed to be loose, um, I cannot prove it, but I like morally, as soon as you have a quotient of the Nichols algebra, it cannot be a Hopf algebra anymore. It's like the smallest one with a derivation property. Now, screenings have a derivation property, even though it's not an algebraic, it's a VOA derivation property. So I would say that's the sort of model argument, and probably one can make this rigorous in some sense, that it really has to be exactly the Nichols algebra and not some quotient, because then it would not be possible. I mean, what you need for an exact proof would be something like enough fields such that the nth order products are non-degenerate enough so that you could detect all non-zero terms somehow. I mean, it cannot be that all the nths or products are zero, then then somehow you, you cannot recover the whole co-product or so, but, uh, but somehow in the non-degenerate sense, it's really exactly the Nichols algebra because of the universal property. But this is not proven. So this is proven. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it, it, I would now go into the proof a little bit and then show examples unless there's questions on the... Yeah. You say this theorem states that the, you, you get this possibly quotient of Nicolas algebra, but you expect it would be exactly isomorphic to Nicola Fergus. I would expect it to be isomorphic to Nicola Fergus. As I said, if, if there is enough non zero nth products running around, if, if there is, if, if all nth products are zero, I cannot make that statement because I have no way of seeing the, the co products. So, um, it could be that in principle there is some quotient, but as, as soon as the stuff is non degenerate enough and one should make this precise, but just didn't do it. One should do this. It's probably not. In this case, if the. These screen operators in generate algebra, which is the image of a quotient, quotient of Nicolas algebra. So yes, it's uh, the proof. The, is it a Hopf algebra? Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, if you know it's a Hopf algebra, it has to be the Nicolas algebra because it's the smallest Hopf algebra quotient. Oh, so but so whether the screenings give a Hopf algebra, you have to somehow see the co product on the VOA side, which you do because the screenings are in the relations. Form a, it is equivalent that the screenings form the Hopf algebra. Exactly. Uh, okay. Exactly. It's exactly it's a good so so uh, how how the uh, how the proof goes is more or less you just don't be scared of these weird expressions I mean we saw that they are very weird but what we do now is as follows we simply write down and I have to say that the proof now I think sounds actually quite easy and I'm actually happy about this this is, this is good and not bad uh, at the beginning, I tried to prove this in small examples, like SL3, and I got crazy. I remember sitting in this apartment in Moscow and trying to prove for SL3 how this works, and it did not work. 
And you, you see at some point that some functions have to be zero whenever the Nichols algebra says that you have to be zero and you want to prove, you see this in examples, but you have no clue how to prove this. And then you somehow rethink it and rethink it. And at, at the end, it, it's clear that you prove it for all Nichols algebra at the same time. It's not more difficult than doing SL3 in some sense. I mean, it's like a, a proof that uses the defining properties of Nichols algebra. So the idea is the following. So let's take a, a product of screenings applying to some vector. Um, then what you can show on the VUA side, it's not difficult, it's basically using OPE arguments. You see that you have certain functions that depend on this alpha i, alpha j, and they also depend on alpha i lambda, on these two things. I will call this now mij and mi. So there's functions depending on this. This is what the series that you get by multiplying these series, this weird series, times this like leading factor. And then there's higher terms, which also involve functions like that. So, so I, I always call them in quotation marks structure constants. So the product of screenings can be somehow simplified and they only depend on these, on these functions, which you can write down. They are like n-fold hypergeometric series. And I think for a physicist, that's not surprising. E to lambda? Yes, I should put e to the lambda here. There's a different notation, sorry. Yes, each lambda. Just an example. If there's other stuff here, you just get higher terms. But stating that would take much. I mean, you have to do n fold products and so on. So I think I think it's enough to see in this case. So e to the alpha and acting on e to the lambda, you have this first term, and then you have terms that have plus ones here and so on, like 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 before. But that's the essential thing. So so now actually, I want to not do too many VUA calculations, but the, the statement is actually that this statement is almost equivalent to the fact that these big hypergeometric series in n variables have linear dependencies exactly as the Nichols algebra say. So now I'm completely going away from VOA. It's not a VOA statement, actually. It's a statement that there is certain analytic functions which have linear dependency exactly where the Nichols algebra has relations. Why you don't have to look at those And because they look the same. So the higher terms would be, for example, so the, 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 the complete picture is something like, um, so for example, in this case, the complete answer would be as follows, just to give you an impression. So screening alpha one till alpha n applied to E lambda. What that is actually is you sum over K one till K n out of n. And then you have this F here with alpha I alpha J and with alpha i lambda plus ki so so here you play you, you get more terms here plus and then um e to the lambda times a k1 times derivation of e to the alpha by k1 factorial and a k2 derivation of e to the alpha 2 divided by k2 and so on so you get an explicit expression in, in, in of these so it's like, like these formulas before, we always had like a tail of derivations. They have to have this because of translation invariants. But some of these are fixed. This is not the, not the interesting part. And if you have here more device, then again, they just modify here. So I have, I have some general formula, which, which is somehow the first half of an associativity formula. So the second half doesn't hold in a non local setting, but the first half holds. And you can sort of simplify until you have some expression like this, but here not so explicit, but here with some normally ordered products and stuff like that. But these terms are exactly interesting. But I have to say in the, in the local part, this is exactly binomial coefficients. So when you ever worked with, with, um, with the normally ordered products, there's always binomial coefficients appearing, which you can compose and then you sum again and stuff. And somehow these hypergeometric functions generalize this in non-local setting. So it's like now not any more binomial coefficients, but hypergeometric functions, depending on these uh, non-integral uh, non values. So now we want to prove the statement for the function f. Yeah. Could I interrupt? So yeah. Do you derive this formula by writing down uh, the uh, the formula for the screening fields, then commuting all the operators past one another, and then performing your residue calculations? Or... Yes. Yes. So I, I basically write down a formula. Well, I write it down in a very own style, I think. But uh, but so so I write down the formula by by using basically basically what you do in the OPE, right? Mm -hmm. You write it down. Uh, and then you have you have a yeah 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 okay, yeah, yeah yeah and then take the residue and somehow this is is it simply the residue of a large series that has all these con these set contributions from here basically basically very close to when you take d phi and d phi you get some binomial series all right but the point is because we're not uh, 
assuming that our residue contours are closed, we're going to get contributions from all over the place. Yes, all well. contributions. That's what makes this exactly. Messes. And you get a hypergeometric series. And if you have integral values, then this hypergeometric series collapses to a binomial coefficient. So this is really just the binomial coefficient you would get in a in a n-fold LPE computation. Is it a two f one or something more complicated? In the smallest case, it's two F. It's in the smallest case, it's three F two. But in, in general, it, it's going to be complicated. Yes. Yes. Okay. But it's like a generalization of that. Exactly. So it's, always it's, Fuchsian. it's always Fuchsian. Yes. Yeah. Nice. So so in, now let's prove this Nichols algebra statement exactly over this hypergeometric functions. That's much more interesting. So first of all, I have to think about convergence of this, and then I can rewrite this as an integral, and then all the physicists will say, "Oh, this was trivial anyhow," because the integral is actually much easier than the series. But from my perspective, I have to start with the series because I really apply screenings like. As they are, I don't integratable stuff. I like really apply them as a series. So uh, the following thing I call maybe generalized Seebeck integrals. So this appeared in some cases in other works, and I will quote them. But um, so from my perspective, uh, I in this form I use it. Um, given a set of complex parameters m i and m i j for i and j between one and n, then I consider the n-fold contour integral. This is like n-fold residue now already combined together. After I do the series. Um, of here is product of zi to the mi, and here is product of czi minus zj to the mij. And here is something in LaTeX messed up. It should be dz, of course, dz1 to dzn. And now I integrate them, and I have to be a little bit careful. I integrate them actually over lists of circles with increasing radius, and then I let the radius converge to. That's exactly what we talked last time, right? And if you do this directly globally, you would probably use local systems, but I get them somehow from the series side. I get hypergeometric series, and then I prove that they converge and that they are equal to this. You just need a non-trivial element in that homology. Yes, that's one. exactly. And this integral, so, so you see this integral has a non-trivial monotony around the zeros with mi, and the non-trivial monotony around ij with e to the i pi mij. And that's exactly the braiding. So the braiding is exactly the monotony of this guy. Um, and this integral convergence under, for example, the following condition, which is I call subpolarity uh, in, in, in some papers um, for some reasons. If for every subset of indices larger than two, if I take the sum over all real parts of the MIJs that's larger than minus the size of the subset plus one. So this is basically the condition that this you can integrate this. To, do a lot of analysis, annoying stuff, but it's not difficult. I mean, it's stuff that you're, you're supposed to do. And um, so this is a convergence condition. Uh, and if this holds, then this holds. And in particular, this is difficult to check, of course, for large expressions, but you can prove in particular if these alpha i's are from, from a positive definite vector space, positive definite scalar product, and the length of the alpha i's is smaller than one. So if alpha one till alpha n has positive definite gram matrix alpha i alpha j and the length of alpha i are all smaller than one, then you always have subpolarity. So for all expressions, because it's not just x1 till xn, it's sort of you have a monomial, right? You have maybe five x1s, five uh, x2s, 10 x3s. You have to check that this condition holds for them. And you do this by reformulating this in some space for all monomials. What does this subpolarity mean? This. So the condition basically means that everything is braided, but you're still above the first pole. So if you look at if you look at this on the whole complex plane, then at some point at minus one starts poles to appear, and these give new contributions to the to Nichols algebra. So then it's more than Nichols algebra. And somehow this condition means not to be outside of the poles, it means to be completely above the poles. And then you want to analytically continue below, and then you have special points where something happens. But this is that's why it's subpolar sort of the region in which sort of by stupid reasons there is no poles and the integral converges. You don't have to analytically continue. And then so now what we want to prove is a linear combination of these integrals is zero if the respective linear combination of monomials associated to this in the Nichols algebra is zero, where the braiding is like this. So that's equivalent to this statement. And uh, the idea of this is basically, yeah. <laughs> I'm happy when I can take, make things easy. Uh, the, the idea is basically then at this point not difficult because what you do is you, you take this and decompose this in the braid arrangement. So all different orderings. So which of the coordinate is larger? So then this, so then this zero one to the n is decomposed in for all permutations, some simplex delta. 
right? Which quadrilateral is larger than which? So you decompose this into n factorial guys. And that way you can write this integral as, if you do the analytic continuation, right, as a quantum symmetrizer of another integral. And that was at some point the, the, the idea that I got uh, after doing all these petitions by hand. What is, suppose you believe such a statement, but you don't know how to prove it. How would you ever prove that certain integrals are zero if a monomial in the Nichols algebra is zero? Well, you use the universal properties of Nichols algebra, which says everything is zero if it's in the kernel of the quantum symmetrizer. How can we prove that the integral is in the kernel of the quantum symmetrizer? We have to, we have to show it is the quantum symmetrizer of something else. Because then if it's in the kernel of the quantum symmetrizer, it will be zero. Use exactly the braiding, doing this calculation with this quantum symmetrizer, with these different orderings, you exactly reorder these variables, use the braiding. And in fact, for general case, it, it, it looks pretty much the same, but you cannot write down explicit integrals. You have to use all this uh, EG uh, one um, machine about regular singularities and so on. You cannot do it by hand. Here you can do it by hand. Yes. And uh, we just have time for looking at examples. So we had two types of relations, just to see explicitly what this means. We have two types of relations, relations in degree two, that something commutes, and truncation relations. Um, let's look at the relations in degree two. In degree two, that was my first hint, you can really compute this integral in terms of Euler beta functions. So it is the result. We do some partial fraction decomposition. It's a little bit of work, analysis exercise. I didn't do analysis for a long time at that time, but it was a good to repeat. So you can really work out what the structure constant is for two screenings. It's just this function, period. So mi2 is uh, right, the angle between the screenings and mi and m2. And, and what do we see? What we see is we can write this as quantum symmetrizer of some other function, f tilde and f tilde the other way around with this braiding factor. So the main statement comes from the fact that I can write it like this. And you can do the math. Get some expressions, also some combination of beta functions. So, so this is sort of why, why it's true. And let's see explicitly where we see the relations. So the one relation we had, was, uh, so the one relation we had is that x1 and x2 plus or minus one is zero if the braiding one, two is plus or minus one. The commutator and the commutator are zero in the symmetric case. Let's see why this is true. So why should it be the linear combination of this? You see M1 has a different role than M2. Why should the, the this minus this be zero? Well, because M2, and M1 appear in both terms. So you want them to cancel. But this works if this weird sign factor M12 is plus, is an even or odd integer, then this is plus or minus one. And then from two contributions, they cancel. So you see that you can cancel this with this if this is an integer. So you really see that there's a zero in this linear combination if M12 is plus or minus one, which means that, sorry. If m12 is in z, that's what you see. And also for an odd integer, you want to see it's a fermion, so it squares to zero. If m12 and m2 is the same and m12 is an odd integer, then again, this is minus and these two cancel and it's zero. So these are the two relations you see in dv2, explicitly from the formula. And that's somehow what you prove for the general integrals. And now careful, this formula does not hold in two cases, namely if m12 is a negative integer, because then you have poles here in these beta functions, and those cancel with the zeros you get. And at this places, you exactly really get extensions of Nichols algebra. So this is when subpolarity does not hold anymore. If these are negative, right? I said it has to be positive enough. And this will happen for negative definite lattices. So when you do Toda theory or Leo theory, you have also screenings, but, but they are in this case now. So for example, Leo theory for, for P equals to mi so minus one comma one model, um, the screening square is not zero anymore. It's a long screen. And here you have an extension of the Nichols algebra by Ali algebra, a very easy one in this case, but, and this is because you have a pole in this formula. And there's another pole in which the Nichols algebra relation holds. This is a di very different one here in this fraction. And this exactly tells you, and this corresponds exactly to um, extensions of the module with itself, with another module. So, it, so somehow the expression wants to be zero on the module, but there is a possibility of having an extension. And that's why there's a pole here, which allows you to have this non-zero value. So exactly when you can check this for the general case, you have these poles exactly at the places where there's reflection of the Nichols algebra. So these reflection operators that we discussed in the last lecture exactly describe the poles of this function in the general case. And here it's a very easy case. Yes, um, I think we will not do the truncation relation, but this would be this formula. So in this case, you can do, this is actually what, what Tsuchiya Wood did in some sense. Um, in this case, you have a, a integral expression for this f. 
And you can check these things because you have the Silberg, the famous Silberg integral, but this only works if all these numbers are the same. Or if it, these are not the same up to k, you just check polynomials. But in, in general, these are all different, right? Because you want to get a Nichols algebra. And somehow that's what I want to what I want to advertise is we don't want to try to compute the f's. I think this is not possible. So if if all these alpha ij's are the same, this is this Chichia Wood case, um, then you get check polynomials and you can compute this. But somehow I don't want to compute it in the general. I just want to say it has the relations of the Nichols algebra, and I think this is easier to say. Yeah. So without check, yes. Um, and then there's uh, following questions appearing in this area uh, for me, so which I could not settle. So first of all, I want a maximum analytic continuation. So I've worked with this with a PhD student or a bachelor student at some point, get some results, but I still don't have a satisfactory answer. So I want to extend this to all MIJ and all MI and one of the poles. In some cases, I know that because the poles will tell me whether there's Nichols algebra extensions, but I want to sort of not depend on this subpolarity condition, which is a very crude condition that the integral converges. And I think this would be very interesting to know these poles because these poles tell you about the representation field. Um, and you want to check which, which extensions these are. So for the Leo case, I did this. So this is rank one. So SL2, uh, the power of the screening, because you have this uh, Seelbeck, Seelbeck gamma uh, function version for this. And um, you also prove that these Nichols algebra reflection operators are actually local, which means that these products of screenings, exactly the products of screenings that the Nichols algebra tells you to take, these actually are local in a sense of that they commute with the Vita Soro and with other elements in the kernel. Because this you don't have in general. These are messed up operators. I mean, the screening by itself does not preserve anything. But the right combinations are sort of what you see from the Nicolas Albert side. And then let me mention that there is connections to the Seelberg integral studied by Varashenko, Tarasov, Varna, and so on. There is a Seelberg integral for Lie algebra G. So this is not the F. This is some, some special combination of the F that they can express in terms of gamma functions, not a general F. And I ask uh, Varna whether you think in general, he thinks you cannot express in this gamma functions, but it's still interesting to see the connection and also the other way around. So basically yeah. what, what this work suggests is that this actually exists for each Nichols algebra. So you should have for Nichols algebra, you have an expression like this, right? And then you should have a Zeebach integral depending on the roots of the Nichols algebra. This would be nice, but it's not something I can do. Yeah. Yes, and maybe that's, yeah. yeah but in some cases, you know it's local, because otherwise you cannot explain this diagram. Only specific powers. So, so here, basically, basically here in this example, the screening that goes from this side all the way to this side. So, if it's P, so maybe three screenings on this module and zero screenings on this and two screenings on this, that can affect the complex. So, certain powers in the one-dimensional case, certain powers of screening depending on the module you work on are local. This I cannot prove, yeah. but. Well, I can in the one dimensional case because it's further complex, but in general, it wouldn't be nice to have a proof for general G. Yes, it, it should not be too difficult, but you have to like maybe you have to do this uh, equal to integration that, that, that uh, David is talking about or so. So I did not see it right away. And, and, and so in the one dimensional case, you have to further complex, you know it's true, but uh, you don't see it directly. It's not, not so easy because all the steps in the middle are bad. <laughs> somehow, only, only the, the, the complete guy is nice, but the steps in the middle are very bad. So somehow, you need a new proof technique. Okay. So maybe that's, uh, I should stop here. Thank you. Are there more questions for Simon? So you have checked uh, screening operator satisfies Nicolas algebra relation. So do you have some application of your the result? Uh, no. So the <laughs> no. So the so the application. Uh, <laughs> no. So the application is it's yeah, a I, first. Yeah, but I guess uh, you first talk about some quantum group things. So I guess it's somehow. I mean, the, the application for me when I learned this this kernel of screening stuff was it's the first time I can prove in general that the quantum group appears on the VUA side. It's a rigorous statement about something in the VUA world is the quantum group in general or is the Nichols algebra in general. So now it stands to hope, but this is a hope. It stands to hope that the fact that this is the screening algebra tells you that the twisted modules of the kernel of screening. So if you if you now allow like allow twisted modules, that this is the representations of this screening algebra, because that's what happens in orbifold theory, and that the kernel of the screenings, the local modules, are the Trinfeld center of modules of the screening algebra. So you hope you get now statements about the representation theory from this, because that's what you do in orbifold theory. But but I don't have these statements. But so 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 the the, the philosophy would be that that the kernel of screenings is now uh, is now basically modules over this Nichols algebra, um, and and the philosophy, for example, tells you um, 
which screenings you should take if you want to end up in the following moderate cancer category and which of them should be c2 cofinite so for example if you if i give you if you give me n arbitrary screenings and you ask me whether the kernel of the screenings is two c2 cofinite i would conjecture but think <laughs> think that I just check what the Nichols algebra is, and if it's finite dimensional, then the kernel of screen should be t token finite. If it's not, then not. And if it's maybe affine, maybe it's still not so bad, or I mean, then you can play around with this, with this idea. So, so somehow it's somehow it's the, it's the space of endomorphisms of this decomposition. So, so not in a precise sense, but that's the idea. Okay. But there, I have no application. <laughs> no. More questions? Okay, if not. We shall discuss over the break. Thank you. <laughs>